We've got a special guest today, so that means that more than ever, you're in the right place because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show, folks. I'm Matt Kopenheffer, and right here next to me, our very special guest from the Motley Fool, fool.com healthcare sector, Max Macaluso. Max, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Matt. As always, I like to start off the show with a little bit of pop culture TV. You know, okay, I, I actually don't own a TV. You I haven't, don't? I, I haven't watched TV probably since 2006. You're killing me. 2006? Yeah. The financial, you were able to make it through the financial crisis without distracting yourself? I, I was actually, with, I was in grad school. Uh -oh. And all I was doing was focusing on my, my protein, and that was about it. So, so when I tell you that I just restarted watching Mad Men last night, you, that doesn't mean anything to you because you've never watched it. Let, let me backtrack a little <laughs> bit. Uh, I do have Netflix. So, oh, uh, oh, oh. So, so that's different. It's a little different. Um, it's it, it, so I, I guess you, you invite me on your show just to, to humiliate me. <laughs> pretty, pretty much, pretty much. That's what we do every day here. Yeah. That's what where the money is, so, is really about. Yeah. Forget everything I said about not watching TV because I, I I totally watch Mad Men. I love <laughs> it. I think it's an awesome show. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, let's get to the headlines. First headline of the day comes from Reuters. Uh, B of A reports first quarterly loss since 2011 on lofty legal bill. Max, yes, this ha actually happened yesterday. Bank of America reported first quarter results. We didn't get to talk about it because we had a special show yesterday. Long story on that special show. Bank of America's loss. So I I'm actually a shareholder. You are so, a shareholder. So should, I, should I be worried? What, what's should you what's be happening worried? here? Well, here's, here's the most interesting thing that I, pull, that I pulled out of it. It was that $2.4 billion in additional legal reserves. I don't know if uh, you noticed this. Um, but this is basically Bank of America saying, we've set aside these billions of dollars for the legal costs that we had already expected. Now there's another $2.4 billion that we're going to set aside for additional, legal, uh, for additional legal costs. What was a little bit more concerning about it is that on the conference call, analysts were asking CFO Bruce Thompson about these additional legal reserves. And he was pretty cagey about it, telling what these were likely for. The only thing that he really said was that they were for other mortgage-related matters outside of those that we have disclosed previously. So, you know, investors like you, like myself, uh, watching Bank of America, we want to have the sense that there's some end in sight with all of these legal costs. And I think there is, and I think we're definitely getting close. I know we're definitely getting closer to that, but another $2.4 billion into the reserves, that is uh, a, little, a little annoying, I guess I could say. Right. Here's a fun cocktail fact for you next time you're talking about Bank of America at a cocktail party. Bank of America's uh, market cap was near $250 billion in the beginning of 2007. They've now paid out more than $50 billion in legal claims since the financial crisis. Uh, Countrywide's market cap was about $25 billion in the beginning of 2007. And most of, or a lot of, most of probably the legal reserves have come from the Bank of America acquisition, $50 billion, $25 billion continue to believe that is the worst acquisition in corporate history. I mean, uh, do you think Bank of America is, is over the whole countrywide debacle? Ish. I, I mean, looking at another $2.4 in going into legal reserves, it's possible that that's stemming from Bank of America. If I were to blindly bet on it, I would bet more likely it's coming from something from countrywide. I, I think the odds are, are better on that. Let's go to headline number two. This is a little bit better news here. Morgan Stanley's profit rises as results beat estimates. So Max, I don't know how closely you're following the fixed income trading market. Uh, not at all. But it's, so it's been a, that's been a tough spot for the big banks so far uh, this earnings season. Goldman Sachs actually also reported earnings this morning. They beat estimates as well, uh, even though their profit fell year over year. Their trading results were down, in particular fixed income. We saw this at JP Morgan. We saw this at Citigroup. Morgan Stanley, though, Fixed income trading results were actually up, which surprised everybody. Um, I think that there's some good here on Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley is improving. Uh, we now have a 8% return on equity at Morgan Stanley, which sounds terrible, I know, but they've been much worse. 2013 for CEO James Gorman. Uh, this was the first year since he took over as CEO that they had four quarters of profitability. So this is, this is a, a pretty interesting comeback here. Today's results, though, I think more a result of, or the excitement is more a result of jumping over a low bar than anything else. So, Matt, a quick question for you. So, sure. you, you said 8% return on equity doesn't sound good. So, uh, is that typical for banks, or is it just a major improvement for JP Morgan? 
Morgan Stanley. So, well, so sorry, Morgan eight percent is a is an improvement for Morgan Stanley because they've been in dire straits. Is maybe a little bit of an exaggeration, but not too much. Um, what we're really looking for is, um, I mean, before the financial crisis, we were seeing returns on equity in the low 20% range, maybe even the mid 20% range. I think Goldman got up into the 30% range. So yeah, 8%, no bueno, but it's an improvement. Gotcha. For our focus for today, Max, we've got you here. So we're gonna do a little bit, bit of back and forth here. I'm gonna ask you some questions to let the WTMI community learn a little bit more about the pharma and healthcare space. And you can ask me some questions that you have about better understanding banks. Sounds great. So let me hit you up with this first question here. I've been hearing a lot lately about the biotech crash. Yep. Crash, man. Yep. It's happening. Is this really a crash? And, and what, is, what is going on here? Uh, it's a great question, Matt. Uh, it's, it's definitely been on my mind. It's been on a lot of people's minds lately. Uh, to put it into broader context, if, if you look back to the beginning of 2011, I mean, 2011 was kind of a modest year for the biotech sector. Okay. Heading into 2012, things really started to pick up, and then the sector just went bananas in 2013. So I guess, you know, uh, the, the sector's pumping the brakes a little bit. Uh, it was to be expected, but it's just uncomfortable to see stocks that have been doing so well for so long start to, to take 10% dips or, or more. It's so hard to stomach. It, it's hard to stomach. You have to have pretty strong nerves to invest in this industry. Well, that's, yeah, that's biotech in general, Exactly. Right? Yeah. Big ups and big downs. Exactly. Um, but, you know, there, there, there have been a lot of tailwinds. We're seeing some headwinds now. So, mm -hmm. so let's go through both. Um, sure. The tailwinds that, that we saw, 2011 was uh, one of the record years for FDA approvals. So, mm. um, a tremendous amount of drugs were approved. 2013 had fewer approvals, but the drugs that were approved were for multi-billion dollar markets. So okay. huge market opportunities for, for a lot of these companies. Uh, beyond that, you have the Affordable Care Act, so more people getting on insurance. Obamacare, Obamacare. As, it's, as it's better now. Exactly. So you know you, you should be seeing higher utilization rates of, of drugs. Have we actually seen that? Because that I, I think yeah. that was one of the promises, right? Exactly. Uh, we have, but but now we have some headwinds, right? Uh, you're, you're looking at higher drug prices. So mm -hmm. Gilead and its hepatitis C drug, Sovaldi, okay. are kind of in the uh, the crosshairs of Washington D.C. right now okay. over the, the pricing of this drug. So it has a tremendous cure rate for hepatitis C, a uh, ninety percent cure rate, which oh. which is incredible for a virus, right? Sure. Um, it, it's really a paradigm shift in in the treatment of this horrible disease, but. It's priced at $84,000 for a 12-week treatment. Oh. Uh, it raised a lot of eyebrows. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's raised mine. Yeah, exactly. It's being targeted. But if you look at some of the other drug prices that we've seen, mm -hmm. you know, it sounds outrageous, but a lot of other companies are, are pricing their drugs like this. So You know what my mom said? What's that? If everybody else is jumping off a bridge, should you jump off too? That, that's true. And, you know, it's, it's a broader debate. Uh, you have to look at the value that these drugs are delivering and the amount of time it takes to, sure, to, I, to, yeah, to, to shepherd them. I don't want to be flip about itself. it. I know that there are Absolutely. tremendous costs that go yeah. into that. But beyond that, I mean, you know, this is a political debate that we're definitely not going to get into, but it's something that investors have to consider uh, as, as you're looking at the entire sector start to Right, so is there, is there a, th a threat that regulations could come in to cap how much they can charge for, for certain drugs? Um, I, I think long term there, there could be. Okay. Uh, there's been a little bit more pushback recently. Uh, it's, it's a risk that you should you know, keep, keep in your notebook, but uh, I'm not sure that it's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, to go back to your question mm -hmm. of the broader biotech bubble, yeah. um, there's an old country song. I don't know if you know it. Uh, not everything that glitters is gold, right? I, so, you can say I know too much country music, Max. <laughs> me either, but it, it's a good song. You should okay. Uh, so uh, IPOs were a, a big red flag last year. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I pulled some data from Cap IQ. Get this, right? In 2010, 2011, 2012, 12 combined, there were 66 healthcare IPOs, okay. biotech plus, plus healthcare. In two, 2013, there were, by my count, 56. Wow. Right? So okay. almost as much as the three years combined. Yeah. So far in 2014, about 30. So, so on a pretty, pretty yeah, crazy uh, pace there. A, a lot of biotech saw the opportunity to, to raise capital <clears throat> in, in the markets. And uh, I know our colleague David Williamson was looking at the website of a company that went public this year. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, on, on the day of their IPO, their website was under construction. 
So, you know, th there are some well, That's companies. what they need money for. <laughs> exactly. They don't have any money. They need so, some money from the IPO. <laughs> they can build a website. So, you know. It's perfect sense. <laughs> I mean, you, when you see something like that, it, it's a little worrying. You know, the, the old saying was if you had a website during the, the tech bubble, uh -huh. you could go public. Apparently now you don't even you need, don't website, need the right? website. You don't even need the website. You don't even need it. So, you know. You know where the money's going. <laughs> Uh, I, I think if you're a short-term investor and you, you perhaps blindly invested in some biotechs that were, uh, you know, using some buzzwords to their advantage, you know, it, you, you're going to get hurt a bit. <laughs> if, if you're a long-term investor and you went after companies that, that have great assets, that have drugs already on the market, that are already turning a profit, I think over the long term, uh, don't get me wrong, it's going to be bumpy. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't able to call the top. I won't be able to call the bottom. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to, yeah. Max. Don't but, worry. But, you know, if you're a long-term investor looking five, ten years out, I think these companies are delivering innovative drugs. They're, they're curing uh, diseases or, or treating diseases that were previously thought, you know, very hard to treat. So mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm a long-term biotech bull. Okay, I'm going to put your feet to the fire just a little bit here. Of the biotech stocks that have, that have taken hits here, uh, is, is there one that you like more than the rest? I, I still like the big biotechs. I'm a shareholder of uh, Celgene and Gilead. Okay. Uh, again, you know, Gilead, since it, it is in the crosshairs, uh, be prepared for a lot of turbulence uh, sure. ahead. Uh, I think Amgen is also uh, a, a very solid biotech. It has a great portfolio of drugs, few competitors, and it also pays a dividend, which is very rare for biotechs. Okay. But Matt, uh, another thing that investors could look at are um, some of the big pharma companies that have partnerships with small biotech. So mm -hmm. it, it's a somewhat safer way to yeah. to still get get in on this market. One in particular I like is Sanofi. It's it's pretty uh, its valuation is reasonable and it has partnerships with really innovative biotechs like Alnylam okay. and Isis and, and a few others. Okay. Uh, what's your first question for me? So Matt, let's forget biotech for a second. Let, let's go back to what what you do and yeah. do, do very well, and that's banking. So when I look at, at, at stocks in the financial sector, mm -hmm. um, you know, can, can I use P-E ratio as, as a valuation metric or should I just forget that and, and focus on something else? I would, I would guide you to leave price to earnings ratio behind. And, and a big part of the reason for that is that, so in, in the biotech space, you're going to see maybe some amount of cyclicality, but a lot of those are, are secular growth stories, particularly these, these little, the little biotech companies. So you develop a drug, get approved by the FDA, you go through the, the marketing and the selling, you build the market, everything like that, they, they generate more drugs, get those approved. So you're going to see, hopefully, smooth pathway like that from, from here to here. Obviously, a little bit of this in between. With the banks, you're going to see, as the economy goes up and down, their profits are going to go up and down. The problem with that is that when the economy is doing really good, the bank's profits are really high, that price-to-earnings ratio is typically going to look pretty low. And you're going to say, Whoa, super cheap. This is the time to buy a bank. Unfortunately, what's going to happen is that economic cycle is going to turn and at the you're going to go down to the trough, you're going to see a lot of losses, and you're going to say, I don't know what just happened. I don't know what just hit me. And then at the bottom of the cycle, when you really want to be buying, that price to earnings ratio is going to look sky high and you're going to say, I'm not going to touch banks because they look way too expensive. So, when you're thinking about let, let me step back a little bit in terms of evaluating banks in general. Uh, I picked out three things here that, that I think you could look at if you want to look at just three things. Uh, number one is return on assets, um, as opposed to return on equity, which uh, benefits from more leverage. Uh, leverage is something that banks use in general, financial companies use in general. Uh, you're not going to you're not going to want a bank or financial company that's under levered because part of the returns that you get come from that leverage. Too much leverage, as we've clearly seen, is not a good thing. But return on assets kind of strips out the, the uh, effective leverage on the returns that they're earning. Um, a good bank will earn return on assets in the 2% uh, range. I mean, 2%, 2% plus, that's a really nice return on assets kind of range. Uh, U.S. Bancorp is an, an example of a bank that's earning tremendous returns on assets. Um, and part of the reason is that it owns a, non, a great non-banking business that gives it diversification into a fee business, in that case, payment processing. Um, a caveat to that is that while we want to see high returns on assets, we're also willing to, or at least I'm willing to, look at banks that have lower return on, on assets, but we can expect an improvement. Citigroup is one example of that, where the return on assets 
don't look great right now, but I, I think that we're seeing uh, moves being made at Citigroup that will lead to better returns in the future. And uh, sorry to, to go along with yeah. that. Uh, do, do you think that's that's going to be like a, a one-year move, or are we going to have to wait a few years for Citigroup no, 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 to, no, no, to a few years? Share? It's it's going to be it's it's a many-year type of thing. I mean, if you think about the extent to which Citigroup was beaten up during the financial crisis, the dumb decisions that they made, and the the horrible things that they had on their balance sheet, this is a long-term process. I, I think that the new CEO Michael Corbat is doing the right things. But it's not, it's not a one-year process. It's more like a five, maybe even a 10-year process in terms of getting to a point where we're like, okay, Citigroup is in good shape again, like, truly good shape. Uh, number two, credit quality. Uh, particularly, the, the metric that I like to look at is non-performing assets. What are the non-performing assets as a percentage of the total assets? Um, so we want to see those obviously low. But we want to look at them historically and see what happened during times of stress, during times where people were actually stopping paying back loans. Is this a bank that had a portfolio that was able to create a portfolio that didn't see a, a bigger than average spike in the number of non-performing loans? I point out Bank of America as an interesting example. So you're a shareholder, so you'll find this interesting. As an interesting example of a bank that I think was a very good lender prior to the financial crisis, but acquired a very bad lender in Countrywide. Um, so the numbers that you're seeing now, the, the, the non-performing loan numbers, are kind of skewed a little bit by the fact that the better loans that Bank of America made were mixed in with the horrible loans that Citigroup, uh, Countrywide made. Citigroup also made some bad loans. Um, but it's still bad on Bank of America for buying a terrible lender, so we're, we're not trying to excuse them there. Finally, valuation, this gets to your question, Price to tangible book value. That's the valuation metric that, that I typically look at because the tangible book value or the, the equity that the bank has, the tangible equity, that's sort of the raw material that you have that the bank has in order to produce the results. Um, so we, we can think about raw material in, in any other sector. So let's go to the mining sector. We have um, uh, a mine where you're going to go in, you're going to drill out whatever it is, the gold, the coal, whatever it is that you're drilling for. That's the raw material you're working with. In the banking sector, it's this equity that you have to, to work with. The equity, you can then leverage it, you can use that to lend out, and that's what you're going to create the returns on. So you're kind of thinking about, in theory, what are the kind of returns that a bank can earn on the equity that it holds, um, and what are the actual returns that a bank is earning on the equity that it holds. Uh, and then you can you can think about well what's a what's a reasonable valuation on that equity value. So so here's another question. Uh, actually, two questions. Yeah. But let's go for it. Um, would you invest in a bank that was trading at tangible book above one? And the second thing is, uh, do do you think the the industry itself is stable now that we're a few years out from the financial crisis? Well, um, the answer to the first question is yes, I would. Because it's going to depend on, so now I'm going to flip to, we talked about return on assets before. I'll talk a little bit about return on equity. You can compare that return on equity to the price to, tan the price to book value, price to tangible book value that you're paying. So if you're getting a, let's call it a 10% return on equity, uh, and you're paying book value, one times book value, that's a, that's a pretty reasonable valuation. Now, if the, if the bank is earning 30% return on equity, and you only have to pay one and a half times book value, well, I'm going to go for that. So, so it looks more expensive on the surface, but that bank is obviously looks like it's doing something better. You have to go in and figure out what, what causes that differentiation in the returns for both of the banks, because you want that to be sustainable. But I'll take a 30% return on equity on a 1.5 times book value multiple. Gotcha. And, and the second, uh, is, is the banking industry on stable footing? Yes, yes. If we compare 2008 to today, it, there's still, there's still more, more room that could be made up. There, there's still more safety. It, it can always be safer. And, and I think that's an interesting balance that we're trying to find now. What's safe enough versus what's an overabundance of safety which actually affects the performance of banks and, and therefore their ability to, to lend out and help the economy grow. Uh, but if we look back to 2008, we'll take Citigroup as an example here. Uh, leverage at Citigroup, so assets divided by the equity on the balance sheet, was 13.5 times. It's not extraordinarily high. We saw uh, Merrill Lynch, I think at that time, up around 20 times, uh, maybe even higher, maybe even 30 times. But Citi leveraged at 13.5 times. And almost 20% of its liabilities were from short-term sources. 
that's important to note because it's that short term, the short term borrowing that the banks did that can disappear just like a mirage when, when uh, there's financial, a financial earthquake. Today, Citigroup's levered at nine times, so substantially lower leverage, and only 15% of its liabilities are from short-term sources. So that's a significant change in Citigroup's balance sheet, and that was one of the banks that was positioned maybe the worst during the financial crisis. Um, Bank of America, too, I can mention. Uh, this is, uh, I, I, I don't know, maybe this is an example of how far we've come and that we still have room to make up. $50 billion in legal settlements, more than $50 billion in legal settlements paid to date, still tacking on more to its legal reserves. So we've made significant progress, still progress yet to be made. Gotcha. Uh, let me ask that, that, you- that, that was really helpful. Let me ask you one more question before we Go move it. on here. Go for it. Outside of the biotech space, so we're thinking pharma altogether. What is your what is your number one number one top and don't I don't want a whole bunch you named a whole bunch for us last time and that was great number one no, number one if I, yep if I stock you mean number one stock uh, number one <laughs> you're putting me on the spot Matt I but am, that, that's okay I I, 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 I did name uh, a, a few the first time you asked uh -huh. me that but I, I have to reiterate that I, I really like Sanofi Sanofi really, really, okay really like Sanofi. and I'll, I'll give you another reason that, okay. that I didn't touch on before. You're familiar with the patent cliff that the pharma industry went through yes. uh, uh, recently, really, just a few years ago. And a patent cliff is where you have all these blockbuster drugs that are generating billions of dollars in revenue for your company. Mm -hmm. But when the patent expires, all the generic drug makers are, are like ready vultures, there. Just exactly. Crowding. Uh, and, and they sell them at, at a huge discount. So you have your, your revenue here, and it goes off a cliff. It's Not, a bummer. It's, it, a, it's a huge bummer. In technical terms, it, it's a bummer. <laughs> It's a 90% drop in revenue, typically. Uh, and Sanofi w was hit pretty hard, as well as a lot of the other big pharmas. But what Sanofi's management is doing is trying to avoid another patent cliff. And, and they're doing that in, in a very smart, strategic way. Uh, they're just trying to go after markets that don't depend so heavily on intellectual property. Okay. So, for instance, their, their uh, key drug is Lantus, which is an insulin. It's hard to get new insulins on the market. It's also hard to replicate them. So when they lose a patent on it, it will be hard for other companies to, to get in the market. Oh, right? I get it. Okay, that makes sense. They also have a consumer health division. So that's really brand management. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't really depend on a patent. What's an example of a brand that Sanofi has? Uh, off the top of my head, I, I, I don't remember. Okay. But, um, the, 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 but that's uh, what Johnson & Johnson has done Exactly, so well yeah. J&J, &J, right? uh, uh, Merck, mm -hmm. um, Pfizer to some extent, so uh, it, it's it's a typical strategy in big pharma. And the the third thing that Sanofi has been doing is moving into rare diseases. So they, they bought Genzyme, I think, okay. in 2011. Genzyme specialized in what they call orphan drugs, so drugs that treat uh, diseases that um, you know few patients are suffering from, but they're horrible, uh, often genetic diseases. Uh, you can price those higher because you know you, you have to be incentivized for for right because they're very a small few, market. Yeah. Um, so, again, you know, they, they also have partnerships with small biotechs. They're doing very innovative uh, drug discovery, like l nylum with RNA interference drugs. So Sanofi, I think, uh, I'm, I'm not a shareholder. Sounds, sounds interesting. But um, I hope to be one day. But it's on your, okay. It's on my radar. Unlike me. unlike banks, um, pharma and biotechs, or let's let's say pharma, can be they can be valued on price to earnings ratio, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So is Sanofi and, and, and you know, also also some biotechs can too. I mean, if so, they have uh, profits, if they have profits, <laughs> a lot of the big biotechs do. Oh, uh, right. Their multiples are usually much higher because they're growing at a much faster pace. Um, also, most biotechs, uh, I named Amgen as a, an exception, but most biotechs don't pay a dividend. Right. Big pharma's typically do. So Sanofi does. Sanofi does. So you get a dividend, reasonable PE today, or uh, I I think so. I'm I'm not sure where it's trading. Right this moment, but last time I checked, its uh, its valuation w was in line. Uh, I think slightly less than a lot of the other big pharma's. Okay, all right. Now we're going to move on to the game for today, and this is uh, this is a new one. This is a new one for our WTMI okay. audience. We're going to call. I, it I, I've never played a game on on camera. I'm a little well, nervous. You should be. Okay. You should be. This is well. This is new for the WTMI audience. Okay. We're going to call it Fast Picks okay. with Max, and I've got I've got a bunch of I, I've got a list here uh, of things that are squaring off. You just give me your answer. You don't have to go into to any detail or very much detail. Just give me your answer. Number one, fast picks with Max. Johnson & Johnson or Abbott Labs? Johnson & Johnson. Okay. Uh, Brad or Angelina? Angelina. 
Okay, intuitive surgical or anilum pharma. Did I say that right? Alnylum. Alnylum. Uh, that is, oh, oh, you're killing me here. I. See, we asked the tough it, questions oh, here geez. at where the money is. I, I mean, it, it's hard to compare the two. They're in oh, yeah. Industries. Can, you bet. Can, can I pass? Is nope. No? Nope. There's no passing in fast picks with Max. Boy, I'm going to go with uh, Alnylum on this one. Alnylum it but, is. But that, that is the spicier one of the two. I, I, okay. I have pretty high risk tolerance uh -huh. with, with my own portfolio, and uh, Alnylum is doing some really, really cool. have a very strong really cool. stomach. Uh, pretty strong. Okay. Uh, hot dog or bratwurst? Hot dog. Okay. Uh, medical devices or pharmaceuticals? Pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals. And finally, World Cup, Max. Brazil, Argentina, or Germany? Italy. That's who's going to win. That's the wrong answer. I'm afraid it's, it's the right Germany. answer. We have a lot of German listeners on WTMI. Germany is it. I'm sorry. Sorry, I, sorry I, I can't I, say the U.S. No, no, I, I, I love Germany. <laughs> I, I actually lived there for a few months when I was an undergrad, uh, but my parents are from Italy. Uh, I think Buffon, their goalkeeper, <laughs> is, is just the best player in history. Is there I any chance Italy. that Italy wins it this year? Uh, there's always a chance. There's always yeah. a chance of anything, right? Chance. Plus, I think their manager is outstanding. Cesare Prandelli, amazing. You should read Soccernomics. It's questionable whether that manager will make any difference whatsoever. Interesting. All right, closing out <laughs> as we always do, great job on Fast Picks with Max. Closing out as we always do on the Twitter sphere, uh, here is our first tweet. The first tweet is from the Wall Street Journal, that's at WSJ, and it says, you could soon be paying for your morning coffee with your palm. I think we've got a, we've got a picture here of a palm reader reading somebody's palm. I think I, I saw that briefly this morning. Did, did you? Yeah, okay. I, I, I didn't read the article. Uh, what, what is it about? Tell me. Well, it's, I, I mean, I was just at a payment technologies conference last week, so we've got all of these new technologies vying for how you pay for things. And, and there's some really cool stuff happening. I mean, PayPal is an example of a company that's uh, obviously had a, ha has a good position in the market and is trying to expand that position. They were demonstrating their check-in app where you pull up the app, it shows you what places that are local that'll take PayPal and you can integrate coupons and loyalty things and everything in there. But this throws a whole nother loop. This is just put your palm down, read it, Move on. That's I, talk about security. No, that's amazing. I, I don't think it's amazing. I'm sure somebody will figure out how to spoof a palm. Would you Would you sign up for that to pay with your palm? Sure. All right. Sure. I, I'll do it today. You'll do it today. All sure. right. Let's go for it. You heard it. Here. Oh, are you Are you with me? Sure. <laughs> sure. I'll do that. Uh, number two tweet. Uh, this one, Max, I think is is up your alley. This one is about e-cigarettes. This is from Huffington Post. E-cigarettes may not be as safe as you think. <laughs> Let, let me let me spoil alert here. I never thought they were safe, Max. What's your what's your take? I mean, I, I actually have not dug that deep into this industry. Uh, I'm curious to to learn more about the regulatory environment uh -huh. that it's operating in. But um, I mean, smoking, it's pretty clear that's not good for you. I think e-cigarettes probably provide a, a good way for some people to to stop smoking or mitigate uh -huh. it. Uh, it's probably not good if you're inhaling whatever they have inside. I mentioned Mad Men at the beginning of the show. The first episode of Mad Men is about him creating a campaign for a cigarette company exactly. at the time when they could no longer use health, uh, health claims. So uh, e-cigarettes, yeah. Uh, final tweet of the day. This one comes from Richard Branson, uh, and he says, Great ideas are often formed out of wanting to solve a problem. And I think we've got a great glamour pick of Richard Branson here just... Oh, look at that. Just thinking, thinking about all the possibilities. Max, solving problems. What is one problem in this world that you'd like to solve? One problem, I, I, would, love, <clears throat> I would love to see the drug development process get more efficient and cost less money. Wow. Yeah. That is, that, I'm, I'm sorry, that's kind of a boring, I'm sure you were expecting no, no, something no, a little that's, bit more. No, 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 that's a great I want to heal the world type of answer because yeah. my answer I don't have a robot butler. <laughs> I really want a robot butler. It's a serious and problem. And I don't have one. It's a serious problem, let's face it. I don't know what I can do to solve that problem, yep. but that is the problem. I'll look into it for you. All right. I'll, I'll see what I can find. Well, that's our show for today. I'm Matt Kopenhaf for joining us, our special guest. We're very thankful, Max Macaluso. You can find our show on iTunes, uh, on Stitcher. Uh, you can find us on, fa on Facebook and on Twitter at TMF Financials. And you can email us, WTMI at fool.com. Uh, again, I'm Matt Copenheffer, Max Macaluso. We will be out tomorrow, but we'll see you next week. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. 
Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.